Do you think you want to be a scientist? Thinking about grad school, maybe? Here are some skills to develop as early as possible, setting yourself up for a path to success, um, that entry into grad school, that passage through the qualifiers, all those various things. Here's how you can develop as a scientist and show your worth. Of course, this is just my one scientist opinion. Um, some of it is going to be kind of specific to biochemistry, molecular biology, that sort of thing. But a lot of it is going to be very generally apl applicable. And I am going to share links to posts and videos I have on all of these topics I'm going to talk about very briefly today. So let's dive in. Starting with the wet lab skills. And again, this is the part that's most specific for biochemistry, et cetera, related fields. Um, but don't worry, the rest of this um, stuff is going to be mostly applicable to any sort of science. For those people wanting to go into biochemistry, some of the basic techniques that you should really try to at least familiarize yourself with, if not get hands-on experience, PCR, so copying DNA, molecular cloning, sticking DNA from one place to another, such as taking a gene and sticking it into cells, a plasmid, a circular piece of DNA that you can stick in bacteria and have the bacteria make lots of copies of that and maybe even proteins from it. Gel electrophoresis, so both your agarose gels for separating DNA and your SDS page for separating protein. If you could do some protein expression and purification, that would be ideal. But again, this is something I'm really biased on because I am a protein biochemist. Um, so yeah, <laughs> take that as what it might be. But what you really, really should have is comfort in making buffers and solutions. So both doing the calculations for making them and actually making them um, making sure that you're, that you're using the correct measurement um, devices, if you will, like don't use the lines on the bottles or those speakers to measure, instead use a graduated cylinder, volumetric flask if you wanna be really, really precise. Um, but make sure you're going to, you're not adding the amount of liquid you want. Instead, you are basically adding solids, then putting the liquid to the final volume. And again, this will make much more sense if you check out the links that are posted. Um, so I'm going to, along with this post in the comments, you'll be able to find the live links to all of these different things where you can go and get much more information, videos and um, blog posts, some uploads of cheat sheets and that sort of thing to help you with this preparation. But being able to be comfortable making these solutions in various buffers is really important. Back to kind of the actual experiments, being familiar with the concepts, if not even the actual practice of fundamental experimental techniques like Western blocks and co-IPs. That way you can kind of understand them if you come across them in a paper. Um, so like a Western blot is basically an SDS page where then you go and you look for specific proteins of interest. So that's a fundamental kind of experiment that you'll see come up over and over and over again in the literature, at least in biochemistry and related fields. So it's something you want to be familiar with. Okay, going back to some more kind of generic wet lab skills. Lab math, super duper important. I know, I don't really like math. And I have a lot of kind of tips and tricks and things like that, cheat sheets to help you out. Um, so check out the links if you want to know more about that. But really, what some of the main things are like unit conversions, dimensional analysis, uh, master mixes, et cetera. Be familiar with formula weights or molecular weights. So basically, we just call it a formula weight sometimes because if you have like a salt or something, that's not technically a molecule. But that's just technicality. And you often see formula weight and molecular weight be used interchangeably. Those are just grams per mole. And so you can use that to convert between molarity and weight. Much more on that in those posts, but you should be familiar with doing those calculations um, and be really familiar with kind of interchanging between metric units. In biochemistry, we're often working with really, really tiny volumes, things like microliters. And so being able to convert from microliters to milliliters, just moving that decimal point three places in your head is really important. What's really, really, really important though is experience. So this is a key thing that they're gonna look for if you're applying for grad school, say. They really wanna see that you have research experience outside of just the classroom. So that could be summer research experiences, that could be doing research during the school year with your professor, um, anything like that. They wanna see that you really are interested in research um, and you're not just do, looking at grad school as kind of like the next step because you've been in school all your life and you're not really sure what you wanna do next. This will also help show them that you know really what's what's entail, what research entails and that you're really up for the challenge. 
that it's not always, um, there's going to be a lot of ups and downs, things don't always work out, and you have to kind of go with the flow of science and really enjoy it. Okay, so that was kind of more on the wet stuff. And let's talk a little about computer skills. Well, some of the computer skills, like using a spreadsheet to help you do some of those master mix calculations, super duper helpful. Um, other kinds of computer skills, using databases. There's a ton, a ton of data, by, data out there. Protein sequences, DNA sequences, RNA sequences. And these are all housed in data banks like GenBank and Uniprot. Familiarize yourself with those databases and how to use them. Ideally, you'll have some sort of computer coding or programming. Um, you can take a, just like a basic self-taught course online and that sort of thing. Some basic command line. I'm a fan of Python. It's used a lot in kind of biology and biochemistry. Um, some people use some R, especially in things like ecology. But just kind of, that's an ideal, but it's not like a game um, breaker if you don't have it. Similarly, it's really great if you can start picking up a vector graphics program. So Adobe Illustrator is what I use to make my figures and everything, but it's really expensive. And I only started using it because I actually had free access through it through grad school. And then I just fell in love with it and started paying for it. But that's an investment that I make because I use it so much. And I totally acknowledge that many people do not have that luxury. So there's a free version called Inkscape, which I'm actually having my students start using to help annotate their figures and things. A vector graphics program is really nice because basically it allows you to make uh, figures that are like PDFs and stuff, and you can export them in all in huge sizes without having resolution loss, except for the parts that are actually like JPEGs and that sort of thing. If you're embedding figures, those will still get blurry, but because the vectors graphics program basically tells the computer, put a point here and a point here and a line here and a line here. And so that you can blow that up without losing the resolution. So those vector graphics programs are really great for making scientific figures, for annotating your gels and all that good stuff. Okay, scientific literature. No matter what field you're in, you've got to be familiar with that field. You've got to be familiar with the ways that the scientists communicate to one another and be able to kind of read and learn what those scientists are trying to communicate to you. So you should you start using, if you haven't already, a reference manager program. So something like Mendeley or Zotera. This is going to help you keep track of all those papers you come across so that you can easily cite them, you can find them later all this great stuff. And so these are just like free programs that you can use. And it is super duper easy to kind of just download this. And then whenever you come across a paper, even if you're not sure you're gonna read it later, go ahead and stick it in your reference manager program. And that way you can find it easily again in the future. Speaking of finding papers, get kind of use, um, Practice using PubMed, Google Scholar, Web of Science, these various tools to help you find papers. Often I just find papers like directly through Google and Google Scholar, um, but you can also use more fancy things. You should be able to differentiate between the primary literature, so those like research articles and review articles, and get practice reading both of them and taking notes. So I have a spreadsheet in those links that I'll um, link to where you can kind of, I help um, outline kind of like the kind of notes that you should take. So what's the paper about in broad terms? What are some kind of key fig things that you think you might use? Um, a template for annotating the various figures and that sort of thing. So check that out if you're interested. Um, be able to follow the paths of the references. So when one paper references another and they reference another, be able to track those down. And then if you find that you don't have access to those, you know how to use your interlibrary loan service in order to request papers. Also great to get familiar with like meta-analyses where they analyze a bunch of different papers and kind of summarize the different results, um, that sort of thing. And yeah, lots of types of scientific literature that is, I, I, I take care not to say like get comfortable with it because you're never, like, it, it takes time and practice, um, but it can be done. And you shouldn't be scared of it, I guess is the main thing. That was reading other people's work. Now let's talk about presenting your own work. Ideally, you'll have done some sort of poster presentation that'll look really great. If you can get on a paper, that's awesome. But if you can't, it's really not a deal breaker. So I didn't have any publications as an undergrad, and I still got into um, a lot of grad schools. And I did not think I was going to because I didn't have a paper, and it seemed like it was such a big deal breaker, but it really wasn't. So some people just get lucky and get on a bunch of papers. Some people work hard and get on a bunch of papers. Some people work hard and don't get on any papers. So it's really just kind of a luck of a draw, especially at the undergrad level. 
So don't worry if you're not on a paper. Um, still do go ahead and apply, especially if you have that research experience, whether or not it actually is published. What's really, really crucial too is being able to explain what and why you're doing in the lab and put things into context. So especially like, say you don't have a paper, say you don't have a poster presentation, how are they going to know that you actually understand what you're doing and why? That's where in your application statement and that sort of thing, it's really important that there and in your interviews, if you get them, you're able to explain what you're doing um, and that you understand why you're doing it and put it in the context of the bigger picture. So not just because my professor told me to do this, but oh, because we're interested in this, this and this, and so we're tested this. Oh, but this didn't work, so we decided to test this because we couldn't see this, 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 and we found this, and it was so cool because this, 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 but we're still wondering this, and so now we're gonna do this, 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 and all together, this is in this bigger context, this has the importance of blah, 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 blah. So basically being able to really conceptualize, contextualize your work. In general, show initiative that, and be resourceful. This goes back to having like experience and that sort of thing. They wanna see that you're going above and beyond what you have to do. So you want to take initiative to look up answers, look up protocols, et cetera, try new things. This is really important, but it's overlooked. So science is not about cookie to, um, cutter recipes and things like this. A lot of times you'll have protocols and you'll have to kind of adapt those protocols. You'll have to troubleshoot, you'll have to optimize. You have to look up new protocols. Maybe you don't have one of the reagents that you need. What are some alternatives you can use? Seriously, Google is your friend. It's not cheating. As long as it's not like a test or something like that, you can totally Google to find things like protocols to even things like Reddit and um, Stack Overflow. These have people asking research questions and getting good advice from researchers around the world. And so it's really important that you understand the concepts and you understand how these techniques work in order to know whether things are reasonable and maybe what you can and can't substitute. Um, if you, But it's also really important to kind of just get comfortable Googling. And so you can Google strategically using things like quote marks and plus signs and all that stuff. And so I have a post on um, tips and tricks for helping you Google more strategically. But again, like I Google all the time and it's not something to be ashamed of. If you are thinking about going to grad school, familiarize yourself with the grad school process. Start looking at the potential programs. So a lot of people go like ask me about various grad schools and things like this. And I'm not trying to be rude when I say Google it, but that goes back to what I said as, as a page ago was that you can find a ton of information on Google. And the Google knows a lot more information about these programs than I do in terms of the specifics of the programs. You can typically find almost all the info that you need on their websites. And I have a whole po page of blog posts and videos and things like that about various aspects about grad school, what's involved, things like rotation, so how you apply to a program and then test out some different labs, things like how to write a great application statement, how to um, ace those interviews and things like that. So hope this was helpful um, to you that think you want to be a scientist. If you don't think you want to be a scientist, then you watch this video. I'm not sure why you watch this video, um, but it's totally fine if you don't want to be a scientist. And you can kind of, that's one of the ways, things that being getting experience is really important. And they want to see that you have that experience if you want to go to grad school. So that they know that you really do want to go to grad school. Grad school is a hard process and... It has lots of ups and downs, and the main thing is finding a good supportive lab. And I wish you all the best of success in your scientific journeys and hope that this was helpful.